Hello and welcome to the final lecture in the fossil fuel lecture series. This is part four and it's about coal. So let's go ahead and get to it. So coal, not all coal is created the same or created equal. So coal, it depends. So first off, just like all the other fossil fuels, it comes from the buried remains of you know, plants, mostly plants, and then some animals that go back like 200 million years. So over time, the way you create coal is you might start with a bunch of compressed organic matter and, and it starts out as peat and that's not coal yet. And then over time through burial pressure and heat, you remove a lot of the other materials in there until you're left with mostly carbon. Um, and it turns out that the longer that goes on, the better the coal gets. And so if you get all the way down here to anthracite, where it's been buried and compressed and heated for the longest period of time, you have the nicest quality coal. Stuff that's down on this end that's closer to peat is going to have a lot of impurities, a lot of moisture content. And this little graphic up here, which is from your book, shows that. Um, the, the things up there are not going to be as high quality coal. So when you talk about burning coal, you also have to talk about what kind of coal you're burning. All right, so coal, just like your other types of fossil fuels, is gonna be found in layers within the earth, only this time it's a rock instead of a fluid. So if you're gonna find coal, it's a little bit harder to discover if it's underneath the ground and you don't know where it is. But besides, so it's gonna be made up of mostly carbon. If it was perfect coal and anthracite comes the closest to this, if it was perfect, it would be 100% carbon. But unfortunately, coal has other things in it too. Um, moisture content, which then makes it harder to combust, Sulfur, which can lead to acid rain, and you don't want sulfur in your atmosphere. Trace amounts of radioactive minerals because it is a rock formed in the earth and there's radioactive minerals down there. And then trace metals, and the one that's the most biggest concern because it occurs in the largest amount and it's also very volatile is mercury. Mercury vaporizes pretty easily and when you burn coal, the mercury that's naturally contained in coal is gonna vaporize too and go out into your atmosphere. And then these two pictures just show there's two main ways to get at your coal. One is through strip mining, which means the coal's at the surface, or you can take off a surface layer and get at your coal directly and just bulldoze it. And the other ways, if the coal is deeply buried underground, is to do coal mining. All right, so what are the sources and who's using it? Um, about, you know, 66%. Um, you know, we have a lot of it. The United States has a ton of coal. And so if you look at our share, we have over a quarter of the world's known reserves is in the United States. So this is one of the reasons why people feel, some people feel that the United States should still be using coal is that we have a lot of it. And um, as far as this is the world in 2017, coal has, been, has made up 38% of the electricity generation. But one of the things I'm gonna show you in this lecture today is that coal is on the decline. And then as far as um, sources of electricity generation in the United States in 2016, coal was making up 30% of the electricity generation. And just so you know, when I first started teaching this course in the year, you know, 2001, 2002, coal was making up almost 50% of the electricity generation in the United States. So the drop in just the 20 years since I've been teaching this class in coal usage, in coal usage has been quite steep. All right, so um, again, just in the more recent time, it was 39% in 2014, down to 27% in 2018. So there's some discrepancy with some of these numbers, but realized general picture is that coal is on the decline as far as electricity source. All right, and these just some more graphs that show that. Um, who's using it by region? North America is in green, and you can see this is 2016. You can see the decline there. Um, Asia Pacific is still a big user, but even China, it turns out, has hit peak coal, which means that they're actually consuming less coal than they used to. The other side of it, though, is that coal is actually used to make steel. So something like 71% of our steel is, um, is, is made with coal, and we use an awful lot of steel in this country. So it's a place where coal is still being used. And our steel industry, think about Pittsburgh Steelers, that name. Our steel industry is in Pennsylvania and Ohio region. And again, why do we make our steel there? It's where the large bulk of our reserves are. All right, so this shows kind of projected a current and projected into the future. So the United States, North America is right here, and 2016, we're at that 30% number, but by 2040, we're looking at being more like 18%. And even countries, again, like China, 
China has started to reduce its coal usage so that currently it's getting 60 some percent, but by 2040, it will be below 40%. So if you look at most of these numbers, the good news is because coal is a very dirty energy, energy source, nearly all areas of the planet will be reducing their coal usage over the next 20 years. All right, so where is our coal in no both North America and the United States? Realize that while you see an awful lot of these maps color in, not all of this coal is accessible. So coal is a rock and you have to dig it out. So the places where you're actually gonna be able to extract coal are in the mountains. So our major coal belt is in the Appalachians, which is along the East Coast. And we also have some major coal reserves in the Rocky Mountains. This coal that you see in the Midwest is not really accessible because it's underneath all that farmland. You'd have to dig quite deep down to get to it. So it's really not that usable. And the other thing you wanna note is where's the high quality coal. So anthracite's the highest quality. We have just a little bit of it in the Appalachians, but mostly in our country, we're, we're mining the bituminous coal, which is the next step down. We really don't wanna to go to this low quality coal over here because that's gonna have a lot more impurities. All right, so what are the environmental concerns? I told you it was a dirty uh, fuel source. Number one, um, when you're mining it, a lot of the mining that's going on now in the Appalachians, instead of going to coal, underground coal mining, which is highly dangerous for miners, has less environmental surface environmental impact, but it's highly dangerous to humans, is to go into mines. So what a lot of companies are doing now, not just because it's safer, but because it's cheaper, is something called mountaintop removal. They literally blast the top off of mountains and the stuff that's on top is the not coal stuff and they blast the top off so they can get at the coal layers. And across mountaintop to mountaintop, you'll find the same layer of coal in all of those mountains. So if you take off the tops of them, you can get at that coal. So what are the effects of that? So it's safer coal for coal miners and it requires fewer men, um, but it literally destroys the tops of the mountains. And it turns out not just the tops of the mountains, but what do they do with all that rock that they blast off the top? they push it down into the valleys and it's all blasted apart rock and dirt. So it is loose stuff and that sediment laden stuff, it's that it ruins the rivers. The rivers tend to flood more. It has too much sediment in it for the fish to be able to survive. Um, and all that muddy stuff just washes down river. So literally it's not just the top of the mountain you're destroying, but every single stream and river valley that comes off of these areas is destroyed in the process. I, and so and part of that, because of all that loose material, when it does rain really hard, instead of being a nice solid mountain that is held, held in place by rock and then plants and trees over that rock, you now have loose rubble. So when it does rain, everything just goes downstream and gets flooded. All right, so this is just a picture of an area and you can see what it, sh what it used to look like in the background where they have not yet taken the tops off and you can see what it looks like after the mountaintop removal has happened. You may not have heard a whole lot about this because a lot of this is in fairly re remote areas of say West Virginia, Virginia, and um, it's hard to get in here as it is. So a lot of people are not aware of just how devastating this is to the, to the landscape. As far as how many of these mines are, here's West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia. This is the Appalachian Belt. All of the, that red area, those are all surface mines. We're literally talking about hundreds of mountaintops. Um, this, this map shows nearly 1.2 million acres, nearly the size of Delaware. And this is an older graphic. This is 2009, so this is already 10 years out of date. All right, so this is just a little graphic, and you can pause on this if you want. I'm not, it's a little busy, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but it goes through the process in more detail. And mountaintop removal is a pretty important thing that I could see them testing on the AP test. Um, but just as far as how we extract coal, this is one of the major ways that it is occurring these days. All right, I'm going to play this video. It just gives you a little bit more detail about what it looks like. For much of the 20th century, most coal in West Virginia was mined by men working deep underground. But by the 1970s, a new kind of mining was starting to transform West Virginia on a scale that can still be hard to comprehend unless you see it from the air. At first, Coldridge, Mingo County looks like many other forested areas of the Appalachians. But when the fog clears, you'll soon discover that many of the mountains themselves are gone. This is the land of mountaintop removal, a mining technique so powerful and efficient that companies can simply carve off the tops of entire mountains 
to get to the coal buried below. This mine is one of the biggest mountaintop mines in the state. It's called Hobet 21. Not long ago, this area was blanketed with trees and hills. Now, it's a 12,000 acre dig site. It can take just a few men and a few monster machines to destroy an entire Appalachian mountain. Once the trees are clear cut, geologists locate the seams of coal below. Then, the company drills holes, stuffs them with powerful explosive, and blows them up to loosen earth and rock. Next, excavators move in to rip the mountain apart, scoop by scoop. For every ton of coal produced in a mine like this one, the company has to remove 16 tons of earth. The best way to grasp the scale of this operation is to watch it from the air. It looks like a giant sandbox with enormous motorized toys. All this activity has one singular purpose to uncover valuable seams of coal like this one and then dig it out and ship it to market. Surface mining is much safer for West Virginia's miners since they don't have to work underground in potentially dangerous tunnels. But it comes with a huge environmental cost. 500 mountains have already disappeared along with the habitats for hundreds of species. And lives are impacted too. When a mining company carves off a mountaintop, it has to put that earth somewhere. And so, it dumps it into nearby valleys. 3,200 local streams have been destroyed. And entire communities have been forced to relocate when the mining companies buy up the land. All right, sorry for the glitch there. I didn't realize I was going to pause. I was trying to move something off the screen. All right, so there's... Um, more detrimental effects from coal, uh, coal mining and coal burning. So coal contains sulfur. That is just in the, in the lower the quality of the coal, the lower you get from that anth anthracite, um, the more sulfur it's gonna have. It can have up to 8% sulfur sometimes. Sulfur is a really common element on planet Earth. It's why when you go to volcano sites, Yellowstone, you always smell it. It's a very common element. The problem is, is that when you burn coal, you send that sulfur into the atmosphere and that creates um, sulfur dioxide, which then makes sulfuric acid, which then makes acid rain. So that's one of the really nasty things about coal burning is that you get a lot of sulfur that goes into the atmosphere because of it. So um, if you look at this as a map of acid rain, and we'll be talking more about acid rain in our air pollution unit, but this, these red areas right there show really um, acidic rain levels. And when it drops below, when it drops down to numbers into those oranges and reds, you're looking at, um, places that it's going to be hard for your plant life and everything to survive. So, and that area coincides exactly with where our coal burning and our steel industry goes on. So that is one of the huge um, downsides of coal besides that mountaintop removal. The other one, which you already know about from our toxicology unit is mercury. Mercury, the largest source of mercury out in our environment is from coal burning. And again, that mercury is already in the coal as long, along with other nasty metals, I might add. But when you burn the coal, the mercury vaporizes. So other, other metals in the coal, when you burn it, might go into the coal toxic ash, which we'll talk about in a moment. But mercury volatilizes, it vaporizes pretty easily, so it goes out the stack. And then that goes into, the, it goes into our water systems, it goes into our food chain. And um, as you know, it's quite a large problem. So mercury, you know, here's a little fish map over here, or not map, but a list of fish, things that they don't want you eating, especially if you might, if you're pregnant or a nursing mother. And it's kind of sad because that is nearly all of that mercury contamination is from coal. So if you look at our mercury emissions, most of it's coming from power plants, which is coal. There's other places where we get mercury, but just this is a huge chunk of the pie. All right, so other things, soot. Uh, you know, coal's a rock and you're burning it, you're combusting it. So if you've ever had a barbecue and seen that black stuff that gets on your meat and whatnot, you know what we're talking about. It's basically the same idea. So um, there are ways you can take care of the soot. You can put scrubbers on your plant. This is a little picture of your coal plant here. And it used to be we just pump it right out into the air along with all that sulfur. But now we have things we can put on a precipitator to get out some of that sulfur scrubbers and whatnot to get out um, the soot and you can use a higher grade coal. The higher the grade it is, the better it's gonna burn and the less soot it's gonna leave behind.
but it's not a perfect process. But in this country, we have come a long way to preventing most of that soot from going out the top. All right, so I wanted to show this. And this is kind of like when we think about power plants, they all kind of work the same way. You need to turn a turbine. And that turbine spins and generates the electricity through some physics that we don't need to get into. But a lot of the times when you turn a turbine, you're doing that through steam. So you can create that steam by burning natural gas, you can do it by burning oil, and you can do it by burning coal. You can also produce steam through solar electricity plants and through nuclear plants. So a coal power plant is kind of a nice distillation. I like this picture because it's very simple. You put your coal into the, into the boiler and you burn it and it generates the steam which turns the turbine. The stacks that you see, like this one right here in the picture, what comes out the top of that is just waste heat. So that is water vapor. So they, they have to make sure, you know, water expands a lot when you heat it. So they have to release some of it out to the atmosphere. This is generally not gonna be where your contaminated stuff comes out. Your stack is, my, is maybe gonna be where you see your soot and mercury coming out. So in general, what they try to do is capture a lot of that nasty stuff and, and run it through a filter and it comes out in this thing called toxic ash. And so instead of blasting it out into your atmosphere, you can collect it and take it to a dump site somewhere, but that poses its own problem. So it says coal ash is another toxic source of pollution. They have used that coal ash. They were actually putting it down in football fields and golf courses for a while. And I think they've stopped some of that because all of those other metals I mentioned that are not mercury that don't vaporize are gonna be in here. Arsenic and lead and cadmium and all kinds of the, all those other nasty metals are gonna be in that toxic ash. And then the company stores that somewhere and occasionally we have a toxic ash spill where that they store it somewhere and the dam breaks and that toxic ash spills all over. But I like this picture because when you're thinking about any power plant, think about what you need to turn the turbine and for nearly all of our energy sources, you need to turn a turbine and we do it by using steam. So here's another picture how power plants are reducing air emissions. And there's again, various ways you can put in scrubbers and filters, you, you can monitor your emissions to make sure they're not getting out of control. But at the end of the day, you're gonna have, with coal, you're gonna have stuff. You can't get rid of elements like, like cadmium and arsenic. You're gonna have to put those somewhere. Like they're elements, they don't break down. So there's no way to make coal completely clean. You can keep most of it from going out the stack, but you can't get rid of it completely. All right, so what about that clean coal? I have heard President Obama talk about it. I've heard President Trump talk about it. Um, and so when we talk about clean coal, what does that even mean? So um, the idea is that you're gonna reduce those air pollutants going out into the air. So when you see something like this, you want that to be mostly steam, not other things. So early efforts were, were aimed at like taking out the sulfur and taking out the metals and whatnot and not letting those go off the stack. Um, more lately, we're looking at, but the th problem is, is that coal produces a huge amount of CO2. When you burn coal, coal is carbon. And when you burn it, you combine it with oxygen and you make that carbon dioxide. So we, we now know that climate change is a major threat to life on Earth. So um, coal, it turns out, is a big player in that picture. So one of the ideas is, is can you, rather than sending it out the top of the stack, can you take all that carbon dioxide and sequester it, put it back down in the ground? And the idea is how do you put it back down in the ground so it stays and where do you put it? So could you actually, as you mine the coal out, as you burn it, put the coal, the carbon dioxide back in and somehow seal that off? Or are there other aquifers like big salt beds down there, other places down in the ground where you can put this thing, saline reservoirs, et cetera. So the idea is you would inject it back in. All right. so could you store it? And this would make burning coal carbon neutral. And this sounds like a great idea. Um, so there's a Norwegian company that's been exploring this and they've built this plant um, and they've been able to store that CO2 in the ground. So the, the thing would be like, this is awesome. Why don't we do this to all of our coal plants? All right, and here's another idea, like could you sequester it, pump it back down into the ground, like I mentioned with the natural gas talk in the last one, or could you put it down in these, again, deep, aquifers that are now empty, spent coal bed caverns, you know, all of this seems like a really great idea. All right, so the problem is, um, I used to show a 60 minutes in class, it, it would cost per power plant, like we're, if we were to do all power plants in the country, assuming we had the technology for this, it would cost trillions, and that's trillions with a T. So it's unproven. Um, you could pump the CO, you could spend all that money and pump it all down into the ground. And how do you know if it's gonna stay there? You know, the ground is not like a solid thing. It has cracks and whatnot seeps. That's how fracking works, right? 
So you'd have to somehow figure out how to keep it down there forever. And that, as a geologist, I just don't even see a good way that that would work. Um, huge amount of energy. So even if you built the carbon sequestration plant, the amount of energy it would take to run all this and look at all the piping and everything, it's just, it's huge. I just don't know that it's economically or even technologically feasible at this point. We're maybe on the edge of the techno technologically feasible, but economically, I do not think this is viable. So um, anyway, so it, it, it also, you know, the other downside is that it's promoting the use of coal, which just, this is not talking about the mercury or um, you know, like this, there are other, or the mountaintop removal or all the other negative impacts of coal. All right, so, you know, can coal be clean? Personally, my opinion is, is that clean coal is an oxymoron. It just is not a possible thing. It puts more CO2 into the atmosphere than any other fossil fuel, like double the amount, I think, from natural gas. Um, more than 60% comes from strip mines. And again, we're destroying the Appalachians to get that coal. Um, and again, this, this technology, you know, I could be wrong. 10 years from now, I might be like, 10 years ago when I used to teach this, I said, this was a ridiculous idea. And then I'll be like, I was wrong. You know, so I would, I would be happy if that was the case, but you know, I just think we're a long way from being able to Im implement this. All right, so pros and cons. Um, it's, we have tons of it, the United States. We have more coal than we know what to do with. So we actually export coal. Um, yeah, we have at least 300 years. So we do not need to worry about energy standpoint that if we use our coal. All right, so it had also, it burns really well. It has a high net energy yield, especially with mountaintop re removal where you're taking a lot of the people out of the picture, you're lowering your costs. Um, we get a lot of energy for burning coal. All right, but it's dirty, all right, in both in terms of air pollution, carbon dioxide released, major environmental degradation, especially if you're doing that mountaintop removal or any kind of strip mining. Um, it's a major threat to human health. And again, just not only um, for Two, two fronts here, coal miners, but also the people living near coal plants. That stuff is coming out. You, you can't take out all of the soot and all of the bad things, especially the mercury comes out. Um, and with this, we think this is responsible for a lot of respiratory diseases and people who live near coal plants. Just so you know, uh, Washington State has only one coal plant down in Centralia, and I don't know that they're going to be keeping it open forever. It's the only one, and we'll probably never have another one because Washington State has a law saying that any new power plants have to be at least as efficient and low on the emissions as a natural gas plant. All right, and then coal mining. Besides the black lung inhaling the coal, there's a new um, condition, I think it's called silicosis, where when you're actually blasting the rock on either side of the coal, it's got a lot of silica because most rocks are made out of like quartz type minerals. And that silica actually just shreds your lungs. And so they're finding an increase in incidence with coal miners of lung disease where they're in their like 30s and 40s and they're, they're almost like they have the lungs of a 70 or 80 year old. And so coal mining is a hugely hazardous profession, both to your lungs, but just like oil, um, oil, there is natural gas that is often associated with coal mines. And so when you um, dig into these, these coal mines, often there are natural gas pockets. And again, any little spark, metal against metal, could set that, um, can cause explosions. And so we've had major coal accidents in the past in our mines. All right, so their trade-offs, again, go to Miller to look at these because Miller's pretty good at laying out the advantages and disadvantages. Always there'll be a bias that they'll, you know, he'll, he'll talk more about the disadvantages, but I have to admit, you can tell I'm pretty biased against coal myself. All right, so um, when you're looking at CO2 emissions per unit of electrical energy, this is where I mentioned that coal has um, way more emissions, oops, and it just advanced the slide, I mean, way more emissions than things, than other things like natural gas, et cetera. So, um, coal is just really huge on the carbon emissions also. All right, so I think the age of coal is past and my evidence is right here. So if you look at coal in the recent years, this is the United States, our coal use has been going down. How have we accomplished that? Because we're actually using more electricity because of our growing population and our growing need for electronics, et cetera. It's this, natural gas. So if you look at this takes off at about the same rate as coal goes down. So we have replaced a lot of our uh, electricity plants needs, et cetera, with natural gas. Um, this is just a historical diagram taking the same data and saying early on we were burning wood for fuel in the United States. And then we discovered coal and we really went to a coal burning society. And then um, in the ninth, starting 1950s or so, we came into the age of oil. And I really would like to see all of these things come down and that the next age starting you know, 2020 and beyond will be the age of renewables. That would be my, my wish for the future. So what can you do as, as far as in the short term? 
is cut down waste where you can. You can insulate your houses, you can convert, use heat pumps. We'll be look, talking about a lot of these solutions in our unit on renewable energies, but you know, a lot, we could save a lot of electricity usage and save a lot of carbon going into the atmosphere if we just made things more efficient. So um, your houses are a big place where we leak all kinds of things out, meaning as far as loss of heat, et cetera. And then in the summertime, cooling losses. And then make good choices. I have not been the best of this myself, um, but you know, um, choose vehicles. My, I really, I'm thinking my next vehicle will be an all electric vehicle. I wasn't quite ready. Our infrastructure is not quite there yet for me to be able to have jumped on that when I needed a new car four years ago. But um, I really think my next car will be uh, an electric vehicle. And, and the other piece is, is that you can choose wisely as far as even gas powered vehicles besides going hybrid. You can also choose cars that get better gas mileage. So that's a choice you guys can make as consumers. So that is the end of coal. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop this lecture. And this concludes our fossil fuel uh, lecture series. And we'll, we'll do uh, nuclear next week.